The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Oh, hell no! Whatever! The following program contains opinions expressed by The Dead Zone. If you find this broadcast offensive, <laughs> lighten up, candy ass. What? Oh my gosh. It's a radio show. Hell yeah! That's what I'm talking about. Power up request received. Initiating systems. Powering up transmitters. Welcome to the dead zone. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hear this. September 19th, Dead Zone Paranormal Radio Show. Our good friend Bill Vuckroth, the founder of past Paranormal Association of the Southern Tier, will be our guest. We're going to find out what he's been up to. Also, don't forget, coming real soon, DeadCon in Fort Wayne. That's October 15th, 16th, and 17th. But before that, it's Keith Age's Mid-America Paracon. That's October 1st through the 3rd. We're going to be at both. So come say come, come say hello. Come come by. Come. I can't talk again. Stop by and say hello. Michelle's coming up with the paranormal paranormal news. I, I swear I cannot talk. But first, Void Vader with Poltergeist.
what's going on, guys? This is your man, Vincent M. Ward, and you're listening to The Dead Zone. Paranormal News. Hello. I found this week's article on phantomsandmonsters.com. This was published Tuesday, May 4th, 2021. It's titled, Small Quadruped Humanoids Observed Along Dark Northern Wisconsin Country Road. A northern Wisconsin teen is with her boyfriend when she begins to experience panic attacks along a certain country road. Later, she observes several small hairless humanoid creatures along the same road. And this is her account. This happened to me yesterday, Monday, May 3rd, and I'm still processing it. To preface, I live in northern Wisconsin in an area that has a large Ojibwe population. One thing I have learned from living here is if a native tells you something is wrong, you listen to them. They've been here longer than this and they know what's going on. I'm a 16-year-old female and a junior in high school. Last night was my junior prom and I went with my boyfriend. Because of COVID, the prom was hosted by parents a couple towns over in a small town hall. We had to drive and my boyfriend picked me up. The highway that leads to this town is desolate and runs straight through a forest. It's about 15 miles long. This would be fine, but then we entered this specific area on the highway. I'm a pretty level-headed person. I don't scare easily. When we entered this area, I felt nothing but pure terror. We were surrounded by nothing but woods, and I felt like I was being hunted. There were these garbage bags on the side of the road. The first garbage bag was on the left side of the road. I pointed it out to my boyfriend, and he said that somebody probably dumped it there so that they wouldn't have to pay for garbage pickup. I believed him until we came upon two more garbage bags a couple of miles down the road. They were on opposite sides of the road, equal lengths apart. I shrugged it off. Then equal distances away, there were two more garbage bags. This continued for the remainder of the stretch of the road until the end, where there was a single garbage bag now on the right. I told my boyfriend that the road was giving me a weird vibe, and he did his best to calm my anxieties. He thought I was worried because the road had a fast speed limit, 65 to 70, but it wasn't a fear like that. It was a primal fear. Something there above me on the something was there above me on the food chain. Everything was fine until we left the dance. Pulling out of the parking lot, there was a cop. The cop pulled onto the highway leading to this road when they saw us coming. They didn't use a turn signal, which was very illegal. The cop started acting very weird. While in front of us, they were swerving and kept hugging the line. Then right before we reached the road, the cop with no warning, I may add, just stopped did a U-turn, not even 50 feet from our car, and hauled ass off the road. No sirens, no lights, not even an effing turn signal. My boyfriend and I were weirded out. It didn't help that this road was pitch black and the only light was his car's shitty high beams. We then entered the road, and again, I was terrified. After passing the first garbage bag, the sense of primal fear returned. I wanted out. I started shaking and crying, and my boyfriend did his very best to comfort me. He suggested pulling over until I calmed down, but I refused. In that moment, I was sure that if we pulled over, we would die. I just kept repeating the phrase, something's not right here. He stepped on the gas. Being 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, we were the only ones on this road. Off in the distance behind us, we saw a glowing pair of LED brights. They were pulling up on us fast. Might I keep you in mind the speed limit here was 6570. This car was going at least 8590. And this driver was none other than the cop from before. This cop, again, no sirens or lights, sped right past us and off into the distance. Something in my gut told me that whoever was in that car was feeling the same way I was. Nothing changed for a bit. My boyfriend talked me down and I was calm. But then suddenly I felt the terror again. I, it was stronger than ever. I started having a panic attack and screaming. I was crying and begging my boyfriend to leave because something was wrong. Then I looked out my window and saw them. There were five to ten little creatures coming out of the woods. One looked me right in the eyes and I knew this thing was a predator. They were a bit larger than a raccoon and walked on all fours, completely hairless. 
They looked humanoid and wrinkled. Imagine the top half of a Fuji mermaid, but larger and not dried out. Another way to describe them is a smaller version of the rake. They had eyes that reflected light or that glowed in the dark. They were skinny and frail looking. I screamed and I begged my boyfriend to keep driving. He obliged and he did. Eventually, we left that road and got back to a more populated area of the highway. He pulled over and began to comfort me. I was having a panic attack. I tried to tell him what I saw, but I just couldn't. I told him I saw a malformed raccoon. He just laughed it off. We returned to my house and I was terrified. I had explained to my mother that something was wrong with that road. She shrugged it off, but allowed my boyfriend to stay the night, which made me feel better that he didn't have to leave and got to stay at my house away from the woods and those things. My dad, whom we told about the cop, said that the cop was just trying to rouse us, that the cop was hoping we'd make a mistake and they could ticket us. I'm not sure if that's true. I called my best friend today. She is Ojibwe, who practices the beliefs and culture. When we were talking, I couldn't help but spill. I told her about the creatures in the woods and the cop and the trash bags. She sounded worried. She said the trash bags were most likely from people who volunteer to clean the highways, which I can agree with. They were clear bags. I could see trash in them. She was worried about the creatures. She started asking me questions. She asked if I was on my period. She asked about the spiritual healing practice my mother takes me to. She asked if I tried to contact a spirit or if I had tried to play with something dead. I told her about the natural healing my mother has me doing NAET for my allergies and that I hadn't tried to play with the dead. I told her that that day was the day after my period had just finished. She told me in a concerned voice that the NAET may have opened my third eye and that those creatures may have been attracted to me because of my period. She told me that she was going to give me sage and that I needed to use it. She asked me to redraw what I saw and I did. I sent the picture to her and she said that it was weird but that I should be safe. I am still shaken up. Those things wanted me and were out for blood. I don't think I'll ever go back there again. There's a darkness in the hallway voices that seem to come from nowhere. Alone at night, there is a feeling that something or someone is near. Where can you go? Who can you turn to? Para-X Radio and the all-new Para-X Vision can help. Our knowledgeable host and expert guest can help you find some answers and take a glimpse into the unknown. X Radio and Para X Vision programming for the open mind. Hey guys, so I've been gone for a while. Haven't done any recordings for quite a while now, but I'm back and I'm on my favorite website, Coast to Coast AM, where I found an article titled "What Happened When I Wore a Cursed Crystal for a Week." Now this was dated September 1st, and this was taken off of the website Vice. And it talks about how there are horror stories that are being uh, shared on TikTok saying that Moldavite is a cursed crystal and that horrible things will happen if you wear it. So this person decided to put it to the test and wear Moldavite for a week in a ring. When Moldavite sales skyrocketed over the past year, Michelle Ferris knew right away that it was because of TikTok. For a long time before TikTok, it was not popular except among specific collectors, the Seattle crystal shop, or crystal shop owner told me. At the peak of the Moldavite craze, Ferris went from selling one Moldavite every few weeks to selling about five pieces a day. In the world of crystal healing, Moldavite is a tectite known for heralding powerful transformations that will invite things into people's lives and put people on their highest path. When Ferris first started wearing Moldavite, she experienced a huge surge of energy, she said. Apparently, this feeling is so common that there's a name for it. It's called Moldavite Flush. The purported power of Moldavite may be how it gained initial traction on TikTok. Then came the trove of videos that have given the gemstone an especially bad rap for stirring shit in people's lives. 
In these videos, TikTokers tearfully document terrible news supposedly caused by Moldavite, from car crashes to severed relationships and even death of family members. Stephanie Porth, a student in New York, posted one such TikTok video. In the six months since she started wearing a Moldavite ring, her dog died and she lost some important people in her life. Porth's video, which has racked up 3.5 million views since June, naturally rattled some dog owners in the comments section, but she doesn't actually believe that Moldavite is cursed. Porth noted that a lot of people saw her video as a negative thing, but they don't understand the situation that's surrounding it, she said. In fact, Porth thinks Moldavite has served its purpose of introducing more positive things into her life. Her family adopted a rescue dog, and she made a new friend. Keegan, a 19-year-old in Nashville who prefers to just go by her first name to keep her professional life separate from her TikTok persona, shares similar sentiments. Moldavite's getting a bad reputation is also kind of my fault, and I do feel bad about it, she said. In April, the TikToker made a series of viral videos about the bad things that happened to her after wearing her Moldavite earrings. No more boyfriend, she declared in tears in one TikTok video shot in her car wearing her Moldavite earring. That video has since been viewed 6.8 million times. No more parent, she announced in another video with her standing in front of a hearse. That one got a whopping 10 million views. Keegan told me that she was having a breakdown in her car after ending things with her boyfriend when she suddenly recalled the Moldavite is cursed meme. So she whipped out her phone and made a TikTok video about it. Similarly, the video about her stepfather's passing was a humorous way to cope with her loss. After her videos blew up, she found herself having to explain to panic-stricken viewers that Moldavite isn't actually jinxed. Her stepfather's health had been deteriorating because of brain cancer, and her relationship had been facing circumstantial challenges. I think about it a lot. I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe I admitted to the internet like that I blamed all this on a rock, she confessed. I'm sorry if I just read that sounding kind of stupid. I apologize. The way that I joked about things gave it a negative reputation where people are like, it's going to kill everyone. I'm like, no, no, it won't do that. Now she sees Moldavite as a big inside joke among TikTokers for when something bad happens. Molly Donlin, a Reiki master and yoga teacher who incorporates crystal healing in her practice, wears Moldavite on a necklace almost every day. I see crystals as crossing guards helping you walk across the street to the next part of your life, she said, adding that crystals are not there to drop bombs in your life. I always like to describe the purpose of Moldavite is to help get you from where you are to your life's purpose, said Donlin. So it really supports you in making changes that are in alignment with your soul's calling. Donlin also thinks that a lot of the claims on TikTok are wildly exaggerated. Ferris, the crystal shop owner, agrees. Crystals, whether it's Moldavite or not, are never going to work against you, intentionally harm others, or cause devastating situations, she said. While crystal enthusiasts have defended Moldavite's cursed reputation, I was still itching to test it. Will it F up my life or stoke good fortune? I wanted to know. So I bought a Moldavite ring, fashioned it into a necklace pendant, and wore it for a week. Here's what happened. Day 1. My first day of wearing the Moldavite necklace was massively uneventful. Day 2. I went for a run with my Moldavite ring and on my way back, I think I kicked a frog. In case the significance of this encounter isn't clear, I'm terrified of frogs. I didn't dare to look at the ground to confirm my fear and sprinted away in a moment of panic. I also tried and failed to pet a stray neighborhood cat. Pretty devastating for someone who likes to think of herself as an animal whisperer. Day 3. Again, nothing eventful happened to me on this day. My editor did call in sick, and while the cursed crystal didn't bring me mishaps, I did wonder if it was working its curse on the people around me. Day four, dinner with friends sent me into a spiral over COVID-19 paranoia because I had been suffering from a stubborn sore throat and my friend was sharing stories of COVID-19 cluster at her workplace. That night, I decided to get tested at the doctor's clinic. Day five, this weekend was supposed to be filled with morning walks, Zoom interviews, miscellaneous errands, and meetings with friends. It was gearing up to be lots of fun, but also scarily hectic. 
After taking a COVID-19 test that required me to be quarantined for about a week, almost all of my plans were wiped clean. For the first time since I can remember, my weekend was completely free from plans. I was homebound, of course, but free. My weekends, I realized, have been busting or bursting at the seams with activities and errands, leaving me barely any time to just sit and simmer. This quarantine weekend was shaping up to be the rest and relaxation that I sorely needed. Day 6. By Sunday, I was well rested, but a little restless, which was just the right spur of motivation I needed to start making plans for a personal newsletter and podcast and getting back into watercoloring. Basically all the projects that I keep brewing at the back of my mind, but never had the time or headspace to really consider. On this day, I also found out that I did not have COVID-19, which meant I had essentially canceled all my plans for nothing. I can't say I regret it, though. My idyllic weekend was amazing. I also couldn't help but imagine that this was perhaps the Moldavite's way of clearing my schedule. Day 7. Another uneventful day, the last before I took off my Moldavite ring. To be honest, I was kind of disappointed that nothing that extreme happened. Or perhaps I need to give it more time. I think the difficulty with a week is that there are changes you might be too close to notice it, Donlin said, when I told her about my experiment. Sometimes it affects its effects are immediate, and sometimes you don't really notice much at all. But when you look back on your life, a year later or six months later, you realize, wow, a lot of things did change for the better. Stina Garbus, a professional psychic and longtime crystal healing enthusiast, told me that she believes crystals work more on your mood and experience rather than hitting you brick to face with unexpected changes. Moldavite especially can help those who have goals but have trouble achieving them. First, get a clear idea of your goal and the potential barriers. Then you can allow Moldavite to work its charm and get rid of those barriers, she said. So it's basically practicing more mindfulness, which is almost always a good idea. It's all about mindset and what you get out of your sessions when you're using your crystal, she said. I'd like to think that Moldavite helped me catch a breather over the weekend and forced me to get started on personal projects I've been procrastinating on. Even though my week-long experiment has come to an end, I'm inclined to keep my Moldavite on for a little while longer just to see what else it has in store for me. What's the worst that could happen? Coast to Coast AM article, former director of National Intelligence hints at revelatory UFO report, dated March 22nd, 2021, written by Tim Benal. In a recent interview with Fox News, former director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe shared insights on the UFO phenomenon and suggested that a forthcoming government report on the subject could contain significant revelations. His intriguing comments were made during a conversation with Maria Bartiromo this past Friday evening, positing that the former Trump administration official saw the most intelligence that anyone has ever seen other than the president. The host noted that the government is required to issue a report on UFOs to the public later this year and asked Ratcliffe if such strange objects have been seen. Although he chuckled, when Bartiromo initially broached the topic, the former DNI offered a serious response, saying that the government has lots of reports about what we call unidentified aerial phenomena. He went on to confirm that the government will be issuing a proverbial UFO report in a few months and claimed that he wanted to get this information out and declassified before I left office, but was unable to pull off such a feat. Frankly, there are a lot more sightings than have been made public, Ratcliffe said, explaining that these reports come from Navy or Air Force pilots or have been picked up by satellite imagery. These puzzling objects, he revealed, engage in actions that are difficult to explain, move in a manner seemingly impossible by current technology, and exceed the sound barrier without a sonic boom. Ratcliffe revealed that there are quite a few of those incidents on record and postulated that information on these cases is being gathered and will be put out in a way that the American people will see. As for what could be behind these inexplicable sightings, he indicated that when we see these things, we always look for a plausible explanation citing weather effects or potential foreign technology, 
but conceded that there are instances where we don't have good explanations for what we have seen. Pressed by Bartiromo for more information on where these objects have been seen, Ratcliffe marveled that there have been sightings all over the world. Dismissing the notion that such reports come from a solitary witness, he clarified that usually we have multiple sensors that are picking up these things. Ultimately, the former DNI mused that I think it'll be healthy for as much of this information to get out there as possible so that the American people can see some of the things that we've been dealing with. Fortunately, we won't have to wait all that much longer to see what, if anything, gets revealed to the public as the government report on UFOs is set to be released on June 1st. So if you have any proof of UFOs, sorry about that, any proof of UFOs, uh, whether you have pictures, videos, um, you have an, a story that you'd like to share, email me at michelle.deadzone at gmail.com. That's M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E dot deadzone at gmail.com. Hey, this is Lee from the Dead Zone. I want to give a huge shout out to Shauna and congratulations on her new podcast, Exploring the Paranormal Perspective. You'll hear some amazing guests like me, Whatever. Paranormal and true crime stories and more. Catch her Wednesdays at 8 Central on the Para-X Radio Network. This is Sandy Johnson and you're listening to The Dead Zone.
Bavaria. Are you in a band or know of a band that is currently unsigned and looking for airplay for free? We want to hear from you. One of the main goals of the show is to help promote up-and-coming bands and artists as well as our paranormal community. Getting your name out there can be tough, especially these days. Shoot us an email, deadzonebooking at gmail.com. If your music fits our genre, hard rock, 80s, 90s metal, and new metal, we want to help. radio stations in town were palm trees, we'd be the one with the biggest coconuts. Now, here are the one, the only, Dead Zone. All right, we're going to call Bill right now. Hello? Hello? Hello, now I hear you. Hello. How's it going, man? There you go. All right, yeah. Uh, do Pretty we good, have, how you doing, buddy? Do, I'm doing good. Uh, is there a delay? I think there is. It might be. Might be a little bit of a delay. I don't know. I I hear an echo on on here too, and I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Well, well, well. That's you know, it's our setup here. Anyway, it's been a while. Um, first of all, how are you doing? And yeah. How are the team? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. The team's doing really good. Yeah, we're growing, and it's uh beyond anything I would ever uh, thought we could do. That's right. Just crazy. Right. Love it. Right now. Uh, for you guys that just joined us, uh, we're talking to Bill Vakroth of Past Paranormal Association of the uh, Paranormal Association of the Southern Tier. So, what have you guys been up to? Exactly. So, we have just we're still doing. Uh, I don't know if we were doing these last. Yeah, I think we were last time I was talking to you. We're still doing uh, the uh, public ghost hunts at right. the local museum here in town. Right. To uh, to help raise money uh, for the museum because with the, with the pandemic and everything and mm-hmm. and uh, you know the people cutting back on tourism and travel and stuff uh, they were hurting so right we happened to find a place that we could uh, ghost hunt and it helps them and help them with we have fun doing it and uh, so keep, we've been doing that pretty regularly right it keeps you busy right <laughs> I think we all need to need to keep busy yeah it sure does yeah. Uh, so we started doing them just once a month, and then uh, throughout the summer we were doing it once a week. Okay. And then we just had one uh, this past Friday, and now we're going to start going back to you know once a month as we go. But I think we got two in October because it's October. Okay. Now that's but, uh, uh, other that's, great. We have a lot. Of fun. That's that's what you call what you guys call um, awaking the spirit ghost hunts. Awake, awaken the spirits. Yes, awaken the spirits, and that's at the Heritage Village and. Uh, Museum in Corning, New York, it's Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. Right. Well, that's got to be really interesting. What, what's uh, some of the evidence that you guys have caught? So, you know, every time that we go, when we first started going, we just had, uh, you know, disembodied voices and, and a couple of, uh, you know, the uh, spirit box voices and things like that. But in the, every time we go, it gets, it gets more and more. So the one that we just had this past Friday... Uh-huh. Uh, we were getting uh, shadow figures. We uh, we get uh, just we hear footsteps uh, when we sit in one of the, we have. There's three museums. There's one re- the whole the whole area is one museum, but uh-huh. there's three locations. There's a, a, a an inn, a schoolhouse, and a log cabin. So each location has something different. Right. Uh, we were getting footsteps. Uh, we were using the SLS cameras, so we're seeing the stick figures on there. Uh, right. Flashlight communication we get that runs the gamut of everything. Right, it's absolutely amazing. People really have a lot of fun. We get the most of the people that go and do this uh, are are not people that you'd see are regular uh, ghost hunters. They're just people that are just curious, want to see what it's about. And, right, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Right. Well, that's that's that's, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, can you tell us the history behind these three locations? What's the what's the story? behind them or is there one <laughs> so the the original house there is the it's called the ben patterson house okay uh and that's been here that's the original to the county it's one of the oldest houses in the county it's actually was a tavern and a stopping point for people who would travel through the area to go to other places okay it was a bed and, like what we call a bed and breakfast right uh and then they have built onto it so they moved a schoolhouse 
and they moved a log cabin and a blacksmith shop and built a village. The other places weren't there originally. They were relocated. Right. But it's more of a teaching. They use it more as a teaching location for, for students okay. to show them how people lived in the 1700s and 1800s. Right. And uh, we never thought it would be haunted. We just thought we would go and see what we could find, and uh, it has been. It's, uh, it's picked up amazing. The One of the spirits that we found that, that inhabits the log cabin was a guy named uh, Henry, I believe his last name was Mac Henry, and I think his wife's name was, was Eliza. Right. Uh, and he was in the Civil War, and he, he was wounded in the Civil War, but he survived. And he did he did the live there. So the, we do know that, not just from ghost hunting, but that's what, what we have. That's actual, alert from the yeah, museum. that's actual documenting. And, uh, yeah. It communicates pretty regular. It's really cool. As long as we go in and, and we... Uh, we talk respectful, you know, and talk about the Civil War, and and I don't believe in provoking any of my team. I, I tell my team don't provoke anything. Just uh, right, you know, talk respectful. And, and he was a Civil War soldier. Thank you for your service. And then so we start talking about that, and that's usually draws the best results from right. him. And uh, we'll get the flashlights. He we have seen a uh, there's a rocking chair in the cabin, and uh, one of our guests had asked if it's possible to move the log. Uh, move the the rocking chair, mm-hmm. and I really didn't think that would happen, but it did move. But it actually move. moved. I was <laughs> I was just as shocked as uh, as the guest was. Wow, <laughs> I was in my cool. mind, I'm thinking eh, it's not really going to move, but it did. Oh, it's and, too, uh, too, too yeah, bad you was, didn't have it. Pretty surprised to all of us. Well. Too bad that wasn't caught on camera, right? Yeah, but you're absolutely right, though. Um, I I don't have I I, I don't have it. I think probably. Somebody that was in the group did, yeah. uh, because they, you know, we encourage people to take pictures and shoot videos. So somebody in the group probably did, and I tell them, uh, you know, if you have evidence, send it to me so right. we can post it on our on our page. Post them, don't, right. and I don't, know, I don't ask the last names or anything like that. We just sell the tickets, right? So I hope they did. If they're listening, I'd, I'd hope that they would send it to us. Yes, please do. Because yeah, we all want to see that. Yeah, uh, please do. Yeah. Good. But you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, exactly. What we always yeah. say, we always say, you know, you know, ghost, whatever you want to call them, apparitions, spirits, you know, they are the, they are, they were. Yeah, I just I call people. Them spirits when I'm there. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, they're the same, basically the same person yeah. they were in life. So be respectful, you know. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, because that's you know I don't want to be treated respectfully. I mean, that's, right. That's what we do. Um, and unless you get into the demons and things like that, I don't mess with that stuff. I right. I stay away from that. You know, those aren't, uh, that's not fun for me. Right, the tricksters, uh, yeah. But that's not what we have where we do this here. Right, that wouldn't make yeah, sense. That, that, the demons and everything will trick you. Right, that wouldn't make sense uh, in the museums because, I mean, even if they were built, you have items that were brought in that are from that period that could have an attachment to it. So, right. you, know, you know, you never know. And all, there, exactly, and there's also exactly. there's also exactly. a school. You said, or is that is that one? There's, of the yeah, there's a school there too. Yes. Okay. It's it's a one room schoolhouse. So what I like to do before we start the investigations is I'll go in there occasionally and start playing uh, the sounds from a one room schoolhouse. You can actually find all these things on YouTube. Okay. And I'll go in and I'll put my my uh, phone in there and I'll start playing it. You know, and, and it's. Uh, so it stirs them up a little bit, you know, right. like school's in session. Right, a little trigger. And then, trigger you know, by the time we rotate around and get in there, it's it's, it's in session. And uh, that seems to work, so. That's cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. They seem to like it. There's kids in there. Now, I don't, we don't understand, you know, when kids die. I don't like to, I don't ask, you know, I don't, I don't ask the unpleasant questions to, yeah. to spirits. I don't ask, uh, how did you die? Right. I don't like to do that. Right. Um, but, you know, this was in the 17 and 1800s mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, they would have been in there. And, you know, the childhood death back then was, you know, all that uncop. Oh, no. And yeah. uh, Espec- so things like yeah. that did happen. We just have to accept. Especially when they, when they were so, working in factories and mills and, and such like that. Yeah. That's all. That's the exactly. one. Exactly. And then they had, they had disease. And, yeah. That's always been the one thing when we yeah. go on investigations and, and, and do our thing. I 
prefer not to, well, the, the, the a child's ghost just creeps me the hell out. It really does. I, it, I don't know why, but yeah. it, that is the most creepy yeah. to me. But yeah, so, very cool. Yeah. It, it, well, it can be. So yeah, it can be very unsettling. Yeah. Um, because, you know, talking in the past that, you know, people will tell you that demons can hide as, as children and, and that that's that's true i i do believe that right but we don't feel that here we don't feel that sense and so right we do know that the the resident ghost that that we get the most interaction from at that location is a young girl named emily and she's six years old all right so we do have that so we often hear her voice come through as uh as a child laughing or talking and right. we do we have found out that she is six years old i don't know how in her family you know there was a large family uh and her fa- her parents are there and they're just living at the uh at the museum now they now they didn't live in this house they must have just decided that that they liked it and took up residency there because right. it's not something that they that they that was theirs to begin with they just moved in just all of a sudden they're there maybe and, maybe uh, maybe it's the we, ground that's a belt yeah on. yeah they they're just wandering wandering down the street and said this looks like a nice place <laughs> and checked in. um but we did find that uh that emily does like the young women that come in mm-hmm. and she looks them at them it's more like a uh, mother figure mother I guess. figure yeah and so she will pull on their hair and hold their hand give them hugs it's really kind of weird to to, to to talk like that you know because the people that come in are kind of shocked but yeah but it, it's it was a little girl and and i you know think of it that way don't don't be afraid right. that it's a spirit just think of it it's a little girl yeah what what i was and, uh, what i get over very quickly what i was saying is maybe maybe on the grounds that this place was built on maybe there was a homestead there or something there that's why they're there I don't know. It could be. It could be because the the actual house was there. Yeah. But the but but it's big enough that yeah there could have been there could very well be other houses that were on that property. Right. So yeah, you're actually absolutely right. You're right. Yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, there was a there was a flood here uh, back in 1972. Yeah. Uh, that wiped out a lot of the records, so we don't have access to finding a lot of that stuff. I don't even know where to begin to look for some of that stuff. Right. That's just I don't know. On. I've asked the museum; they don't have any any records of stuff like that, which right. I think is really sad because I'd like I would like to find out right. who these people are and what their last names are and, and a little bit more about them other than what we've learned uh, through our investigations. Yeah, I mean, and and what you what you could find is now gone. And going through county records and that kind of thing, just gone due to the flood. Yeah. That said, uh, yeah, a lot of that stuff was was lost, and, and I don't, and I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know where to go find that, and I, and I need someone on the team that would step up and say, yeah, we well, can all do yeah, that. But ordinarily, the, easy, busy. Or, uh, the easiest thing to do is go to the public library and, and go through their records, go through the uh, electronic files. You know, you know what I mean? Okay, I, does that yeah, make sense? I could, I could, I could give that a shot. Um, yeah, I'd like to find out somewhere. They probably look at me like you're nuts. <laughs> you know what are you looking up? But, oh, you never but know. Yeah, that would be a that would be a shot. But we we could try that because we, yeah, yeah, exactly. We don't we don't know. I mean, we've got first names. Uh, they had twelve kids, and uh, they had seven seven acres of land or seven and a half acres of land. We do have that much, right? Um, that should that would be a start. That, that would be eight, yeah. That would be. They were there in uh, eighteen thirties to eighteen fifties is when they said they were out near that property. So right. it, it would be a starting point, to kind of look. It might take some doing, but we can probably figure right, out. Right, yeah, see if you can find some kind of deed or some kind of information like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I would start. If I was you, I would try. Yeah, anyway. it'd be nice. It would be nice. All right, so. Yeah, absolutely. It would probably put uh, closure to it also. All right. So what do you got coming up, like, as far as going to conventions? I know we're going to be in Kentucky the first of uh, October and uh, I think the middle of October we're going to be in uh, Fort Wayne for the dead con are you guys going to be doing anything like that so we were originally going to go just to check out uh, the the Perry Unity Fest in New Jersey right uh, I believe that's the 25th but I've had something come up so we can't make that one right I think Rochester 
New York has one coming up, uh, and then I just saw somebody announced about a, a Sleepy Hollow one coming oh, yeah. up in New York next year. Yeah, yeah, I, um, I, uh, I posted so that. So I'd like here. to do that. Yeah. Oh, okay, yep. Yeah. And then I'd like to go to, I wanted to go to uh, the Gettysburg Bash, but we had ghost hunts and things going on, so we have to kind of plan way ahead. Oh, yeah, and, uh, absolutely. You know, I, I think I, this, I think I've discussed with you before that I've got cancer, so it's it all depends on how I feel, right. whether I can, you know, feel like get around to traveling and, yeah, and I, what my I, doctor's appointments and things are. Like I said, I, 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 well, I, you know, I have all these places in my mind I would love to go to, and just they just don't, they just doesn't always work out. Right, I, I feel for you, you know, like I, I probably told you, I had cancer too, I had mouth cancer, and it's been like. Yeah, oh, six well, years. It's been like six years or seven years out now, and I'm, I still haven't completely recovered from the radiation and everything like this. Like, wow! I mean, it hit, it oh, hits you, it drags you it, down. Yeah, it just drains your energy. Yeah, it does. It really does. So, so have you seen? Uh, is, how's the attendance been at these at these paracots? Have, has it has it dropped off? It, well, have you heard anything about that? Well, the, the one the uh, the one in Fort Wayne we're going to was called off last year because of COVID. Now they're trying it again. The owner, the guy, the operator, uh, right. Eric Verner, just went to Horror Hound. Um, just now, he's on his way back right now. He said, and he posted some photos. Okay, they did really well, and they're hoping for the same crowd at uh, Fort Wayne. So yeah, I mean. It's, right. You know, it's been, you, you really can't do anything. It's starting to open up now, but I'm you know, getting kind of worried because this second strain that's coming through is, is causing trouble. So who knows? Yeah. Yeah. That's, we've noticed that with our, with our attendance at the Awaken the Spirits because uh, all through the pandemic last year, we were averaging 20, between 20 and 30 people. Yeah. And uh, since, the summer started the second straight it's dropped off quite oh, a bit yeah. i'm i don't know if people are just more cautious now because of what we just went through yeah or or if there's something else going on i i wasn't sure i was wondering if you'd heard anything about uh what gettysburg was like because I some of the photographs that i'd seen it didn't look like there was a whole lot of people there so right i, I don't know i'm kind of i'm kind of skeptical about you know curious as to what's really going on right you don't want to spend a lot of money to go somewhere for a crowd of 30 people and it's not worth it right yeah but uh, we had been, yeah because i mean i love meeting the people the celebrities and all that but it, but for me it's 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 the crowd too it's whole atmosphere yeah you know it's it's just it's just an it's uh it's an event and, the, and if you go there and it's not really well attended it's that's takes away from it i think right i you know we've been it's invited like going, it's like going to a concert i don't want to go to a concert nobody there with 10 people yeah <laughs> right uh, we've been invited. Yeah, we've yeah been, we, I know, right? That's, we were invited to Gettysburg uh, on several occasions, but a couple of them we had to turn down just because I'm, like you know, feeling so run down. There's no way I could get out there on that field and do anything. You know what I mean? Just so beat down yeah. all the time. Yeah, that's. But I'd love to go there. I mean, I've, we've never yeah, been there before. That's, that's well, Gettysburg's nice. I've been there a few times. It's not really all that far. It's about three hour drive from here. Yeah. Um. But, the, but we had such the heat around here in the summertime. It was oh, either yeah. 90 degrees and, yeah. you know, 80% humidity, or yeah. it was it was raining out. And the weather was kind of one or the other. Right. And uh, and you ain't doing you know, nothing. I, no, I'd no. rather go when it's nice and cool. Right. You're not going to do anything out in that heat like that, especially with, with what we have going on. No. No, no way. Uh-uh. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. What, um, so no, absolutely. But, but you know, there's, there's so many places I'd want to go. Um, Friends of mine own a place up towards uh, it's up towards in the Buffalo area called Greystone Manor. Yeah, and it's been on uh, Kindred Spirits and it's say, been yeah, on uh, that. Yeah. Travel Channel. It's an amazing place to go. Right. So if you ever get a chance, you want to check that out. It's, it's a lot of fun. That place in Hinsdale House is out. Yeah. You know, Western New York too. That place I've been to. It's you know that's one of the ones that has the a little bit more of a negative feel to it. Yeah. Um, which is great if that's you know people like that. It's active. But uh, I tend to, you know, stay away from things like that. I did go there, but I tend to not want to go to places like that. Okay, when you were in Gettysburg, um, either either times that you were there, 
you know, you always see on the TV the, the apparitions of, of soldiers. You hear the gunfire, the cannon fire. Did you experience any of that at all? Right, right. So I did. So this. So I started. I went to Gettysburg. It was probably about uh, twenty years ago now. Yeah. And back then, I didn't have the uh, the equipment that I do now. I don't even think it was a lot of this equipment was really available. Now you can order a lot of this stuff on Amazon or order right. online. Right. But uh, when I went down there, uh, yeah, we heard the cannon fire. We heard the gunshots late at night, which was really strange because it was it was in the summertime. It was a little bit on the warm side, so. So we stayed at a motel that was not far from the battlefield. I just sat outside, you know, went outside to get some fresh air mm -hmm. and uh, sit outside. It was probably, I don't know, 2 o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden I started hearing cannon cannon shots really? or cannon fire. And uh, that was really strange, very strange. And we walked through some of the cemeteries down there, and you could smell just like you walked through someone smoking uh, pipe tobacco. Oh, yeah, really? And... Uh, it, the experience was, was amazing. Yeah, yeah, and we, you know, went into the Jenny Wade house, and uh, you know, we had some experiences in there. Uh, with, with with of course that was a that was a guided tour. Yeah, and uh, it was just a lot of fun. It was, it was, the Gettysburg is a whole different world. It's whole different, just, whole uh, different vibe. Yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah, but no apparitions. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Didn't see any. Um, didn't see anything. Those are. I've only seen a few apparitions. I've seen some. That I did see one of uh, a woman at the museum that we go to. Okay. Uh, that was the one that uh, we. It's called. We call her mother. That's because that's the only name that she's given us, and she is the mother of the family. And typically, she is in this in this kitchen area, which is the open hearth old-fashioned kitchens that they have right and she's in there quite a bit so if we sit if i sit in the in a couple rooms over to be like the, the main dining room it's a huge dining room like you'd have in a in a restaurant okay uh i sit in there alone while the rest of the group is another in the, either the schoolhouse or the log cabin or whatever and you'll hear foot footsteps in there and you'll, you'll think that someone is in there cooking Right. And I've had several people sit with me, and I'm and and go let, go in there and see if there's somebody in there. Maybe someone walked in the door. They go in, they look, they come back. And they're like, "There's nobody there." Yeah, I said it happens all the time. Right. So it's just like, uh, and it's like they're going about their business. There is the spinning wheels, and the looms, and all that stuff where they're making their fabric. And we let uh, our guests uh, use our equipment, and they like to use the SLS camera, the camera that shows the stick figures. And right. Quite often, they will go up there and hold it and aim it towards the, the spinning wheels and the looms, and you'll see them like they're working. Like they're so work. it's almost like they're on the other side of a bill, like they're going about their business, and we're over here. So right. So it's almost like we're the ghosts. You know, it's like they're going about their business, and we're looking for them. It's it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so I'd like to, you know, maybe that's what's going on in Gettysburg. I, I, it's not so much – I don't think it's so much residual at the, at the museum down here because they do interact with us. Yeah. But they're just going about their business, right? Like you say, and, like, uh, like I the, did have one on the, uh, on like you say the that? other, like you say the other side of the veil. Yeah, I get you. I understand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so I did have one. You know, we were in the bedroom area investigating, and uh, it said, "I'm tired." So I'm thinking, "Tired." <laughs> you guys get tired too. I just thought that was really kind of odd, you know, but. Right. Uh, yeah, so that's you know Gettysburg and places like that where they're just going about their business and and things. Uh, you know, maybe we're intruding on on what they're doing. Could be. I just wonder how they. I wonder what the ghosts think about when they. You know, if they still look and see if they can see us. What they think about cars driving through and and us with the cameras and all this stuff. They right. you know if they could be fascinating to them, right? Them. Be fascinating to them. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, sure. it's got to be really strange. Right. Well, Bill, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go. We're gonna run short here. Um, PassParanormal.net. Now you can get tickets to uh, the event from that website, or, or is, is that not right? Tickets to yes. your ghost town. Yes, so you can get them from there, or you can just go to the Heritage Village of the Southern Finger Lakes in there Corning and buy the tickets right out there. There you go. And I'm sure they're not not expensive, right? No, they're we all ours are only thirty dollars, and uh, and that's you right. know it's for usually two hours, 
thirty dollars. Uh, we don't for like it. to we don't like to take people out at uh, you know all night. It's just something you can do. Go to dinner, go to this, and then you got the rest of the night. Usually we do them from either seven to nine or eight thirty to ten thirty, depending on uh, right. the time of the year. Right. And uh, and people seem to enjoy it. Right. That sounds like it sounds awesome. I mean, we've got uh, the uh, ghost walks in uh, Indianapolis here. That's kind of like that, you know. And it's kind of cool. It's interesting. Yeah. But passparanormal.net. Yeah. Thirty dollars for the tickets, man. That's that's cheap. You guys go check it out. And thank you very yeah, much, it Bill. Really is. It thank, really is. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming on. We hope you will come oh, back. Thank you. And and uh, next time, uh, bring some team members with you. Absolutely. Yeah, I've talked to them. They're a little shy, but I think I can talk them into it. Oh, well, there's no reason to definitely try it. There's no reason to be shy on this show anyway. And we're you know so laid back and and ridiculous. I, <laughs> you know, I know. I. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah. You, I, I appreciate it though. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, tell, tell your tell tell your folks hi. I will. I will do that. All right. Bye. <laughs> Hey, this is Lee. If you missed tonight's show or any other show, you can always check them out in the archives on the ParaX Radio Network, or you can go to our website and click on any of your favorite apps. This is the Dead Zone Paranormal Radio Show. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.